Jordan, and welcome to today's CME activity. There is no commercial support, and the speakers and planners have disclosed no relevant financial relationships with any commercial interests. You will receive a SurveyMonkey link after today's activity, and if you're viewing online, the evaluation link will be listed in the chat section, and if you're viewing after the fact, you will find the um, evaluation link in the um, description section of the video. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Z. He is the Medical Director for Critical Care, Co-Chairman of the Interdisciplinary Critical Care Committee, and a GME faculty at Northeast Georgia Health System. He is a graduate of American University of the Caribbean for Medical School. He completed his internal medicine internship and residency at St. Agnes Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. He has also um, completed a pulmonary and critical care fellowship at Penn State Hershey Medical Center in Hershey, uh, Hershey Pennsylvania. Dr. Z has professional interests in critical care program development and administration, palliative care and end of life issues, extracorporeal life support, telemedicine, medical education, and medical informatics. Join me in welcoming Dr. Z today. And sorry, I have to keep my fuel going. <laughs> uh, so I am uh, Ken Zabelovitsky. I'm one of the intensivists here. I've been here for about three years. And we're going to spend the uh, next hour or so uh, uh, in talking about uh, pain management and pain issues in the um, intensive care unit. Um, OK. I do not have any conflict of interest. The only conflict of interest is my family. I am not paid by <laughs> any pharmaceuticals or device manufacturers. And by the way, I do not speak on behalf of any organizations uh, whose guidelines I'll be representing. This is strictly my opinion and experience. Uh, what we're going to do today is a few things. Uh, we're going to look at a little bit bigger picture than just pain control in intensive care unit. We will um, talk a bit about ICU liberation initiative. And if you don't take away anything from this conversation, your awareness of ICU liberation I th will be sufficient. And I'll be happy if, if coming out of here, you'll understand how important uh, this whole concept is. Uh, we'll talk about PADIS and ABCDF bundle, guidelines and ABCDF bundle, which are part of the Liberation Initiative. Um, we will talk about part of the bundle and guidelines uh, specific to the pain management. As, as we will discover together, the guidelines uh, composed of multiple recommendations on multiple topics, but pain is number one. Um, we will talk about assessing pain in the um, intensive care unit. Um, we we'll talk about some challenges in, in how pain is assessed. We we'll talk about how pain is managed. Uh, and then uh, hopefully we'll have some time at the end to um, uh, go through a clinical scenario based on the case. Perhaps that will be more entertaining and, and, and dynamic and, and I would appreciate uh, if there is any input from the audience. Uh, so let's start with uh, uh, the paradigm of ICU liberation. So this concept has been in existence since about, well, since 2013, so for about 10 years. And about 10 years ago, the whole paradigm uh, of ICU care changed because before that time, uh, the goal was for somebody to survive their ICU stay. <clears throat> so when patient came in very sick and we did our best and they re recovered and were moved from our ICU, we celebrated and we thought we're done, you know, we're happy. What we started realizing about 10 years ago that this is not good enough because many people who survived ICU stay either came back to ICU or did not survive uh, the hospital stay, or even if they survived hospital stay, they were ridden with uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, difficulties uh, relating to their family, health issues, 
uh, psychological issues. So the, the focus of what it is to do good ICU care started changing from short-term successes of leaving ICU to a longer-term um, uh, success of, of getting patients back to their baseline and functional. And that was uh, the, what the ICU liberation uh, initiative is all about. So the Society of Critical Care Medicine spearheaded this liberation initiative um, and specifically they looked at um, the, the factors that precipitate delirium in the ICU because the uh, belief was that uh, it is a delirium precipitated by ICU interventions that uh, is hurting people after they, they are released from ICU. Uh, and it was thought to be connected to agitation uh, strategies, uh, agitation, sedation strategies, pain management strategies, uh, mobilization, sleep, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that was the focus of the liberation guidelines. Uh, so Society of Critical Care Medicine came up with a what's called PADIS uh, guidelines. It used to be PAD, uh, which is Pain, Agitation, and Delirium Guidelines. It later grew a tail of IS, which is Immobility and Sleep. Um, and that was a theoretical... Um, base for uh, how we should do things in ICU. Uh, the second part of the Liberation Initiative was ABCDF bundle, um, which was a implementation plan on the, on the PEDIS guidelines. So here, I, I was a little bit ahead of myself. So guidelines offered a... Um, evidence-based approach to delirium prevention in the intensive care unit. And the bundle was essentially a um, set of steps that were rolled out to facilitate implementation of the guidelines in practice. Um, so this is from the IC Liberation website. If you guys, if anybody is interested, uh, it is on... Um, uh, as uh, Society of Critical Care Medicine uh, website, so you can look at the details. It has all the educational materials and, and, and guidelines, and you can look at them in details. But you can tell how they list two components. Uh, one is PEDIS guidelines, and the other one is ABCDF bundle, um, which A stands for uh, assessing and, and addressing pain, B is for both spontaneous uh, uh, spontaneous breathing trial and uh, sedation vacations. Um, <coughs> uh, C is for choice of, of uh, pain medications and sedative medications in ICU. D is for delirium. E is for early mobility. And the latest addition to the bundle is F, which is family involvement. So that that how that whole uh, uh, initiative represented, uh, that's the current, current state. Um, so that's how it all began. In 2013, uh, when we decided to do things differently, the PAD guidelines uh, came out, uh, which were then in five years later uh, uh, converted to PEDIS guidelines, and several elements were added, and this is what we're using currently as, as our guide to, uh, to practice critical care medicine. And in 2014, the ABCD bundle was created to facilitate the, uh, the uh, implementation of guidelines. And since then, the uh, E, or, or, or I'm sorry, the uh, F uh, element was added, which is uh, family. Um, uh, one year later, after the guidelines were developed, uh, the uh, society received a grant uh, for implementation of the uh, 
uh, guidelines. Uh, 77 uh, facilities participated and collected data on, on how successful we are in implementing the guidelines and what is the clinic, what, what are the outcomes? Did it make any difference? Well, apparently it did, and this is not trivial. So if you look at that 70 facilities that, that uh, uh, were involved, uh, here's the numbers. Decreased in next day mechanical ventilation, 72%. Decreased in next day uh, comatose state, 65%. Decrease in ICU readmissions, 46%. Reduction in hospital death, 68%. Reduction in next day use by, of free strains, 63%. Decrease in next day delirium, 40%. So this is not, this is not trivial numbers. Uh, considering how many ICU patients come through the intensive care units, you know, annually, if you look at this percentage, uh, you'll see how many lives were saved or returned back to functioning by implementing these guidelines. Um, so currently, uh, the, the, the current guidelines is uh, uh, 2018 edition. And um, there were, they, they were modified from the original 2013 by uh, adding immobilization and sleep dis uh, disruption topics. Um, there, they introduced about 70% of new content. Uh, interestingly, they included former um, ICU patients and ICU survivors as part of the group that developed the guidelines, so which made them more relevant. And they also incorporated experts from Europe and Australia um, and that, that was a change from the original guidelines. Now, how they did it, it it's kind of interesting. It's a separate, art, and again, you can probably look it up uh, uh, on PubMed, but there is a separate study that related not to the guidelines, but simply to methodology of how the gu guidelines were created. So they had 32 experts. They had... Uh, Physicians, they have methodologists, they had uh, survivors, they had a couple librarians, and they created this group. The group um, was meeting face-to-face uh, -face and, and through the remote uh, means. Uh, the group um, essentially um, um, came up with the topics that the group felt are important for ICU. And um, there were two, um, and so first they, they, um, they decided what topics they like to discuss or, or endorse, and then they went into the um, searching evidence pertaining to each topic. And then they, based on evidence available, they made recommendations uh, on, on topics related to ICU pain management and sedation. There were two types of, of, um, of recommendations they made. One was simply um, uh, not actionable statements, such, something like, you know, sleep in ICU is important, or, you know, pain, man, pain should be addressed first before sedating patients. So those were not really evidence-based, those were consensus statements. Uh, also, there were specific statements related to specific therapies, which they actually did the, uh, the comparison of what is the current state is and what, what it should be. And in, in that part, they actually used, uh, you know, statistical, statistical methods and, and uh, analysis of the literature to come up with evidence-based statements. Uh, they also, um, graded the evidence according to the quality and strengths. So there were either high, moderate, and low. Uh, when it came to strengths of recommendations, there were strong, weak, none. And they um, graded recommendations for or against uh, certain uh, interventions. Uh, most importantly, they also identify 
areas that require further interest. So there were some topics where they said, we don't have enough information how to do it. So we don't have any recommendation, but this is an area for, for further investigation. Uh, so as a result, they came up with 37 new recommendations. Uh, they had a couple good practice statements, a uh, couple kind of non-actionable statements, and um, there were some questions that they had on the list, but they failed to answer. Uh, in disclosure, this was not strictly about the pain uh, management. This was whole spectrum of guidelines from pain to sedation to delirium and on and on and on. But we'll, in this particular discussion, we'll focus on, um, on pain management only. Uh, I included this list for people in the pain section, just for you to realize there, you know, it was, it was a multidisciplinary effort. There were physicians. Uh, you know, there were pharmacists, uh, there were patients, so uh, very, you know, w different perspectives were considered, let me put it this way. So um, this, was a, this is a focus for today, assessing, preventing, and managing pain. Um, and uh, the guidelines made a point of saying that uh, it should not done it should not be done haphazardly. It should be done in a um, sequential fashion. And they made recommendations about each step of that sequence of assessing, treating, and preventing pain. By the way, when I could, uh, you, you'll see on my slides, I put a reference to specific articles that a recommendation is based on, so you can uh, look it up in details if there is an interest. Um, so it all starts with assessing pain. How do we know how much pain somebody is in so we can address it accordingly? Uh, the guidelines recommended that the gold standard is a self-reporting. And we'll, we'll look at the scales in a minute. So self-reporting is a, is, a, is a gold standard. Whenever you can use self-reporting, this is what you should go by. And guidelines specifically made a point of saying we should be, um, we should take patients' transport. E essentially, if patient says they are in pain, we should trust them that they are in pain because the pain is, is subjective. Uh, now, not all patients can self-report pain, you know, if they're in coma or, or they're, you know, altered or they're intubated, they're nonverbal, there are some limitations with using self-report, even though sometimes it's possible, then the next best would be looking at behavioral changes. Uh, if there is no behavior, you know, if they're in coma, then uh, the proxy uh, the family member or the caregiver or the nursing staff um, could be used to, um, to assess pain um, appropriately. And finally, if none of those methods work, uh, it was suggested that we would assume that pain exists. And again, we'll, we'll go over things in detail, but uh, I think what, what guidelines suggest is that ICU environment is known to cause pain. You know, we do procedures, lab draws, turns, things like that. So it, it will not be, it, it, to be on the safe side, we should, should assume that pain exists. Um, so self-reporting scale is self-explanatory. It's essentially a uh, numeric scale from one to 10. And the patients are presented with that and ask the question if they're in pain and they ask to uh, quantify it and they either can point at the number or verbalize the number. And that is validated tool. By validated, it means it, it repeatedly gives the same result. Uh, and the guidelines recommend using it as a golden standard. Um, so when it comes to behavioral assessment tools, there are several that are validated. Um, one is a Critical Care Pain Observation Tool, or CPOT, and this is what we're using in our ICUs. 
uh, or there is a behavioral pain scale and they can be used interchangeably. This is essentially institutional preference. And as I said, we use um, CPOT. So CPOT looks um, at uh, several domains and grades several domains. Uh, and the, the CPOT score is uh, calculated. So facial expressions, uh, you know, whether it's relaxed, tense, or, or, or patient is grimacing, there are so many points, body movements, uh, muscle tensions, ventilator compliance, the patient is tolerating beyond or coughing or, or fighting it, and, and um, vocalization. That's, that's our tool. Uh, equally uh, uh, useful tool is behavioral pain scan, a scale, and this one represents the one for intubated patients. They have a separate um, behavioral pain scale for non-intubated patients. They're slightly different. But essentially, you're, you're uh, observing uh, grimacing, you know, muscle tone, and things like that to come up with a score. One of the important points is the score you get from either CPOT or behavioral pain scale is not the same as a score on the numeric pain scale. So if whatever score you calculated, you can compare that with a you know, patient grading their pain at six uh, by, by the numeric pain scale. So we shouldn't compare them. Uh, also, it's important that um, behaviors, uh, behaviors uh, they, they are looked at as a indicator for absence or presence of pain, but not the pain intensity. So if we use behavioral skills for, for pain management, uh, it's kind of trial and error. We use the scale, we determine the patient is in pain, then we use interventions and we reassess and see if pain is still present. Uh, surprisingly, vital signs uh, are not deemed to be a indicator for pain. So, and I've, I've heard this multiple times saying, you know, we decided to medicate the patient because they were tachycardic. Um, so according to the PEDIS guidelines, we're missing one step here. The vital signs should prompt pain evaluation. And then based on that pain evaluation, the decision should be made whether pain should be treated. But just based, you know, we should not deliver pain medications just simply based on vital signs, bypassing the step of, of, of some kind of valid, using validated tool to assess the pain. Um, this is from uh, article in 2012 on proxy um, uh, on, on validity of proxy um, assessment of somebody's pain, and that was pretty good. And they looked at treating physicians, they look at nursing personnel, and they, took, they look at families, and, and the, the correlation between the pain and the, the perception by the proxy was pretty good. So if, if none of the better methods available, and we do it all the time in ICU, you know, when we institute comfort measures, uh, you know, when, 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 you know, family, we would try to involve family, but one of the things we routinely tell the family is, please let us know if your loved one feels uncomfortable. It's very hard for me to assess if they're in pain. If, if they, how does it look to you? And please let us know if they, they look to be in pain or comfortable, let us know so we can fix it. This is common approach in ICU. Um, there are cases when patients cannot self-report or have behaviors because they're in coma or they're neuromuscular blocking agents. Um, we always assume uh, that pain is present, especially if underlying pathology uh, is painful. If somebody has, you know, lines and tubes and catheters and wires attached to them, they're probably in pain. If somebody just had surgical intervention or, or, or the procedure, they're probably in pain. You know, and somebody has 
um, underlying conditions like cancer, you know, arthritis, chronic pain syndrome. There, there are lots of hints to, to tell the, the uh, uh, practitioner that, that pain is present. Um, there are certain populations where assessing pain is difficult. Uh, for example, um, uh, people who might have cognitive uh, impairment. Um, they might not verbalize that they have pain. Uh, and it has been shown that as providers, we underestimate pain. You know, we like to be conservative with pain meds, and that's perfectly acceptable. But, but keep in mind that, you know, we might be wrong in our assessment. Uh, older adults is, is population that... Uh, perceives pain differently. Uh, half of the older adults, they experience pain, pain daily. Um, some of them are afraid to admit to that. Um, many have degenerative changes. Uh, they also have decreased threshold of, for pain. And because, as I mentioned earlier, because it's an objective feeling, uh, their perception matters. And it should be addressed appropriately. Um, there are certain hints that can help working with older adults. Um, verbal rating is probably the best for them. Uh, sometimes you have to repeat the instructions or allow enough time for the response. Uh, and, and that might help to be uh, more precise in uh, pain assessment. Um, chronic pain patients, which we'll spend some time talking about separately, uh, is also a challenging population because after years of having pain, uh, their behaviors and their uh, psychological and physio physiological response to pain is different. And they might not look and act to be in pain while they are. Um, they also might have symptoms not only of pain, but of pain medication withdrawal which we should be mindful of when they're in ICU because now we're in full control. You know, we, we shouldn't all of a sudden decide maybe they were taking too much oxy. Let's just stop and see. You know, be mindful of, of the history and, and withdrawals from pain medications are real. Um, so the ideal strategy that the guidelines recommend is preventing pain or anticipating pain. So we'll be ahead of it, not behind trying to catch up with, with the consequences. So there are some um, uh, interventions in ICU that are uh, known to be painful. Uh, and we should be mindful of that. And we should uh, treat the pain anticipating it to come during the procedure. Uh, the important concept here, or one of the important concepts here, is um, approach to sedation, which is called uh, analgesia first or analgesia-based sedation. So uh, the, you'll, you'll hear the term analgo sedation in ICU because the guidelines emphasize that pain is something that should be addressed first before somebody is sedated. And it's either a pain agent, usually opioid, should be used for both pain management and sedation because opioids do have sedative properties. So it's either should be strictly pain medicine that is an agent or pain agent should be used first and if necessary, augmented by others like you know, Presidax, Propofol, benzodiazepines, there are you know, a variety of things, but address the pain first. Because addressing the pain first allows you to decrease the, the amount of sedatives used, and the amount of sedatives used is directly related to the um, uh, occurrence of the delirium in all the bad things that come with delirium. Uh, painful procedures in ICU, uh, some of them might not look painful to us, but, but looking at the data, 
uh, you know, things like churning and mobilization. For somebody who is healthy, you wouldn't think of moving being a painful act. Well, for many people who spend days and days and days in ICU bed, it is painful. Doing physical therapy is painful. Uh, more obvious things like drain removal and placement, chest tubes, lines, suctioning, um, that is more obvious. But keep in mind that there are some things that are, because you are, we come, we assess things based on our experience, and if you've never been to ICU, you might think it's not a big deal. Well, apparently it is when they look at the objective data. So be mindful of that. Um, procedural pain interventions. The recommendation is to start with opioids, perhaps augmented with non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatories. Ketamine is good adjunct. Uh, they're also studied uh, relaxation techniques and, and some behavioral techniques that we'll kind of touch, touch on uh, later. Um, guidelines clearly recommend IV opioids as a first line for, for non-neuropathic pain. Um, <coughs> um, they also recommend using, um, uh, using opioids interchangeably according to what your end result is. In other words, Opioids can be converted from one class to another, and you can choose one based on the side effect profile or allergies or other uh, components, but they all can be, you can calculate the uh, e e equally effective doses for all opioids, and to some extent, guidelines suggest that it doesn't matter what specific opioid you're using from the pain control perspective. There might be other uh, aspects of specific drug classes that you might want to consider. So things that we frequently use in, in ICU setting, uh, fentanyl is something we use for continuous infusions, um, have less of a um, anticholinergic, uh, uh, less of a histamine uh, releasing side effects, I'm sorry, and therefore um, less prone to causing hypotension. Uh, but it's relatively short acting, therefore, usually it's used as a, uh, in, in a way of continuous infusion, even though it can be used as boluses. Hydromorphone or dilated and morphine are uh, kind of two mainstay medications for uh, bolus dosing. Uh, they might cause uh, hypotension. Um, also, the, uh, the, uh, drug metabolism should be considered. For example, morphine is renally uh, re, uh, eliminated, so people who develop um, <coughs> uh, renal impairment might be adversely affected by uh, morphine dosing. Methadone, uh, again, this is a personal opinion. Methadone is used uh, as uh, in, in outpatient practice uh, in addiction management, and I'm not an expert on that, and I and I don't. I want to avoid to to to, to discuss the subject. Um, what you need to about uh, you need to know about methadone is that it's a, a drug with very un, unpredictable kinetics. Uh, so the half life varies widely, and um, the amounts that accumulate in patients' body is very unpredictable. So honestly, my my personal choice will be not to use methadone in the inpatient setting, but I, I, I have multiple colleagues who will swear by it. So to, to some extent, this is a, 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 a practice preference. Uh, this is just to... Um, to demonstrate uh, opioid conversion. So usually all the opioids are converted to what's called morphine equivalents. Uh, and this way you can judge, if you like to use different agents, you can judge how much of it you need to use. Um, uh, interestingly, when administering opioids, the guidelines suggested that um, <clears throat> a 
they should be administered over the fixed time interval, but the dose should range. In other words, it's I don't think that's how we're doing it, uh, but that's institutional decision. And the their logic behind that um, uh, recommendation was um, not every patient requires the same amount of medication for a certain pain score. It's very individual. So what they recommend is to have a scale, for example, to say for a pain score of five or right, the, you know, right at the middle, uh, give one to four milligrams of morphine. Now, the, the, I, I can see how some will argue saying, well, then, then you have the, uh, nursing staff practicing medicine when they, you know, you essentially let them decide whether a patient should get one, two, three, or four. Uh, except if they do it based on the um, objective measurement of pain, this is okay. What guidelines recommend, have a range and give a smallest dose first and see what the effect is. If the smallest dose does not lead to desired effects, then, then escalate gradually. So there is still some logic behind the madness, so we don't randomly give um, people morphine based on the wrench, but at the same time, it allows for some flexibility based on individual patient reaction and needs. Um, <clears throat> so we covered that. Um, now, uh, the guidelines also recommended uh, using uh, non-opioids uh, in conjunction or instead of opioid medications to either eliminate opioid use or uh, decrease opioid use because, as you know, opioids come with a variety of side effects. And uh, I, I, keep, I keep trying to... My, my, every, my, my every talk to residents starts with, you know, first, uh, first principle of medicine is to do no harm. So always consider the... The, the, the undesired effects of what you're doing in ICU. Um, so the, pretty much it, uh, incomplete, but, but uh, 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 it's just FYI list for the stuff available for you when you want to use non-opioids. Uh, Tylenol or acetaminophen is one. Again, watch for uh, patients with hepatic uh, impairment. Uh, you can use the IV, um, uh, IV form, which is, by the way, associated with hypertension. The reason I'm mentioning all these things, I am a big believer in, in having lots of things in your toolbox, because the bigger your toolbox, the more versatile you are. At the same time, if you want to put something in your toolbox, knowing it, it, you have to know it uh, in and out. You have to know the side effects. You have to know the desired effects. You have to know how long it acts. Or don't, if you want to use the tool, know everything about it. Um, ibuprofen, gabapentin, which is a, um, good for uh, neuropathic pain, or Lyrica, pregabalin. Ketamine we use a lot uh, lately. It's kind of making it come back to the critical care field. Um, so they're... they're um, options available. A uh, few articles that uh, uh, that looked at uh, non using non-opioids for pain. Uh, ibuprofen was used uh, for uh, people in uh, rib fractures. Uh, intravenous uh, Tylenol was used for uh, <coughs> after uh, major surgery. Um, Bottom line is um, the panel could not make strong recommendations because most of the studies are done within the very specific population. You know, post, uh, post sternotomy patients in cabbage or hip replacement. Um, so they felt uncomfortable generalizing the recommendations uh, for the whole medical population, and the population of medical ICU, but the consensus was that, uh, you know, based upon specific scenario, 
uh, non-opioids should be should be considered and used. Uh, as I said, uh, Tylenol or acetaminophen is one um, very effective. Uh, one thing uh, to know, it causes hypotension. So, and we actually had the case several nights ago when I was on, uh, when you know unexplained hypertension in the patient, and and then we're reviewing the medication list, and they're receiving IV Tylenol, and every period of hypertension was associated with that. Um, uh, gabapentin and Lyrica again. Um, the the studies were done. Uh, in several populations, one in Guillain-Barre syndrome and one in uh, post-open heart patients. So can we generalize to the rest of the patients, to other population? Why not? You know, uh, there are lots of people with neuropathy. Uh, there's actually a neuropathy and myopathy of critical illness, which is a, a condition caused by being in ICU. Um, I, we use it widely. Again, Know your tools. Uh, gabapentin and pregabalin accumulate with impaired renal function. So watch that if you if you choose to 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 augment your opioid uh, uh, management with uh, with gabapentin. Just be aware of side effects. Um, ketamine, as I mentioned, is a new uh, new. It's it's. It's not new, but it's new coming into the ICU field. It's usually an OR medication. Uh, we use what's called um, sub-dissociative doses. So we in ICU use um, the amount of ketamine that is, does not cause general, uh, general dissociative anesthesia, but it clearly helps uh, to augment uh, pain uh, management. Now, um, the studies did not uh, demonstrate that using ketamine improves pain score beyond that of opioids. However, if you use ketamine with opioids, the amount of opioids that you had to use decreased. And therefore, this, the, all the side effects of opioids decreased. Um, there are other, and this is again just for to see how much in depth the, the the guidelines went. Uh, they looked at music. Uh, they looked at uh, biofeedback. They look at uh, uh, behavioral techniques to help with pain. Uh, sometimes I I I, uh, I I found some conclusions humorous. For example, in an assessing of music for pain, they recommended that we actually pay attention to what kind of music it is, and if it's of a you know if it's of a personal preference of a patient. Because when they did the studies, they essentially had uh, some patients taking the headphones off because they didn't like the style of the music they were listening to. So uh, again, there were more to it. And I, at the end of the presentation, I included all the references. So for those who are interested in looking at depth, uh, you're more than welcome to. Cold therapy was evaluated, relaxation techniques. Um, so there were... Uh, most of the behavioral techniques got a weak, uh, uh, they were, they were uh, classified as weak recommendations. But nevertheless, uh, the panel advocated for using them when appropriate. Uh, one of the kind of overarching um, approaches to pain management was to have a protocol based, to have a system behind it. How you assess pain, how you treat pain, it should be a system. It should be haphazard um, approach, you know, dif which differs from provider to provider or from group to group. Um, so this, I'd like to spend a few minutes on uh, the, the specific case. And this case is related to um, how you approach pain management in ICU uh, of people who already come in with chronic pain and now they have acute pain on chronic pain and and some important highlights. So this is from uh, Agency for Health uh, Healthcare uh, Research and Quality. That's a series they do. 
and it's called Web M and M. So that's the case they presented. I, I kind of adapted it to this discussion. Um, so it is uh, 58 years old uh, gentleman uh, has some un, uh, some non-healing ulcer because of peripheral vascular disease. Also has COPD. Um, has some chronic back pain, was in opioids, uh, taking some long-acting morphine, uh, 40 milligrams daily, uh, and, and some, some extra for breakthrough pain, uh, comes in uh, and reports that he's, has, his paid pain is 8 out of 10 in spite of receiving the medications he was uh, receiving at home. Then he goes into the surgery, comes out, and now his pain is 10 out of 10. So, um, as a background, uh, the, the use of opioids chronically has increased uh, over the past few decades a lot, and especially in certain populations. For VA population, 25% or quarter of VA population is on chronic pain meds. Um, and this is a problem, and we all know that. So th this is not a news. Um, so frequently the challenge is to manage acute pain on top of the um, chronic pain. And um, sometimes, um, and, and there, there are some challenges with that. As, as, as I mentioned earlier, assessing pain in chronically, in patients with chronic pain is challenging. Um, some of them develop tolerance or dependence, so they require higher doses. Um, they have um, uh, opioid-induced hyperalgesia, which is an interesting concept that if you continue to take opioids on chronic basis, your threshold to pain actually goes down. Uh, and, and, and some might not be aware of that. And also, it's us as providers, we're reluctant to give pain medications, because even though if we chronically, if we, if we don't work uh, routinely with chronic pain patients, our perception of what the requirement is might be a little different. Um, so um, uh, it's very important to separate the acute pain from chronic pain as a patient who has both, because that would be the mainstay for um, uh, for, for the approach. Additionally, it's important to understand the, um, um, the mechanism for pain and how the mechanism is different for chronic pain the patient might have and then now acute post-surgical pain due to the intervention. Um, <coughs> so um, opioids usually is the mainstay um, the recommendation is to continue long-acting uh, opioids per uh, home regimen, and then you adjust the short-acting opioids to deal with acute pain. So you, you try not to touch their basal coverage. You try to add or augment their PRN doses to cover, um, uh, cover their acute pain. Uh, Oral meds are better than IV meds in the sense they last longer. Um, usually, as I said, use opioids first. Um, and uh, using short-term or short-acting drugs um, intermittently is safer because, you know, once you give long-acting, you can't take it back. Short-acting, you can just pause and see. If, if there are some side effects. Um, <coughs> um, as mentioned earlier, you, you should, uh, regardless of the choice of opioid, you should convert everything to oral morphine equivalent so you can judge how much patient was getting at home and how much you're augmenting it in acute care settings. Um, if you use the same opioid, um, that um, that patient was getting at home, uh, you try to go down a little bit on baseline, about 10 to 20 percent, and allow the you know perhaps more frequent PRN dosing, which gives you more flexibility. Uh, the oral P 
TRM meds are usually scheduled every four hours. The IVs, since they work during shorter period of time, they're, they're, they can be uh, scheduled, PRN scheduled uh, more often. Uh, if you use different opioid, um, you have to be careful because opioid, if, even though you can convert um, everything in morphine equivalents, sometimes people react differently to different class of opioids. So if you switch from one class of opioids to another class of opioids, it's safer to reduce the dose to, you know, perhaps 75% or half of what they're getting at home. Um, that's, I don't want to go into that detail. So this particular patient, um, the outpatient dose, um, um, we should have continued in, in per home regimen. For acute pain, uh, we should have started uh, morphine, um, uh, in, in, uh, preferably in oral form, so they can take oral. And um, baseline of 80 milligrams daily of morphine should have been decreased by 10 or 20%. So the appropriate regimen for this particular patient was 8 to, six, uh, eight to 16 milligrams of oral morphine every four hours as needed. Uh, and uh, also, it was probably appropriate to use NSAIDs to, to augment opioids. So this patient... Uh, continued to have uh, pain over 48 hours, gave, was given more uh, morphine, a total of 165 milligrams, um, and some, some uh, intermittent doses. Uh, he eventually became somnolent and, and started desaturating. Um, he was put on oxygen, the uh, morphine was held, and, and he improved. And they let the resident know um, he's became more alert, but he started developing again t uh, ten out of ten pain, uh, and uh, they gave him more hydromorphone. He still complained of pain, and then they eventually thought, well, we don't want to give him any more pain medications. We'll give him some benzodiazepine to perhaps settle him down. So five minutes later, he was pale. He was minimally responsive, and he was apneic. Uh, and he was given nal naloxone, which is a uh, to reverse opioid uh, toxicity. Uh, he was given more oxygen. Uh, they watched him. He recovered eventually, and he was discharged. So um, one thing to keep in mind is that when you give opioids, there are side effects, and, and they're, they're, they're pretty common. Uh, the, the, how common the side effects are depends on many factors, which are age, obesity, uh, renal hepatic impairment, apnea, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, and, and using high doses. This particular patient was of age, that is of concern. He was on heavy side. He had COPD, and he was using uh, high doses of chronic pain medicine, which all put him at risk for um, side effects from opioids. Uh, again, that's what it says. And uh, um, the overdoses mostly related to prescribing phase, so many providers are essentially responsible for uh, prescribing uh, inappropriately high doses, uh, but the monitoring and uh, uh, the, the, the patient side of it can also affect the uh, incidence of drug overdoses. Joint commission, I know we're, we're, we're uh, um, accredited by different organizations, but the, the spirit is the same. Uh, the accrediting organizations make it the first priority uh, to have administration of opioids in the hospital safe, and they make uh, multiple recommendations on how to do it. Part of it is this series of these lectures to make uh, providers more uh, aware of 
of right techniques when you deal with opioids. Uh, use of, they also suggest use of information technology or um, involving uh, pain management specialist or pharma clinical pharmacist, which we do. We have dedicated uh, 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 pharmacists in all the units, which are of great help, and and uh, I, we appreciate what they do. Uh, in summary, um, you have to be aware of, you have to know the case uh, when you make decisions about the, how to manage pain. You combine, you measure uh, using uh, validated scales, you combine opioids and non-opioids, you, redu you reduce the, um, the basal dose and you focus on uh, PRN uh, doses um, and you you are you should be uh, you should be mindful of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics um, using opioids and other medications that suppress respiration the metal status should also be uh, on your radar like benzodiazepines, sometimes it's anticholinergic meds, sometimes it's antidepressants, sometimes it's, uh, uh, it's a psych meds, but medications interact, it's another consideration. Uh, I included references for those who um, are interested to going into that in more detail, and we're, I think, finally open to questions, if there are any. Thank you, Dr. Z, great presentation. I will remind you, if you're viewing online and have a question, please um, enter it in the Q&A chat, and I'll ask for you. We have one here in the audience. Hello. Great presentation. I just had a quick question on the pain assessment scale. I know some pain clinics are trying to move away from the 1 to 10 scale and go to a more qualitative scale. My question is, have you read anything about it and your opinion on its use in the ICU setting? Um, no, I haven't read anything about it. Uh, unfortunately, now I will. <laughs> um, what I can tell you, just from Gestalt, from you know, for just thinking out loud, um, in the ICU setting specifically, it might be challenging to 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 be quantitative uh, because most of the ICU patients have there there are difficulties communicating from one for one reason or another, either altimental status or being intubated or being sedated. It, it might be challenging, uh, it might not be a bad idea, but it might be challenging uh, to, 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 to put it in practice in ICU. But I'll be happy, I, I'm, now that you got my attention, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be looking at that. Excellent. I don't see any questions online. Any other comments? All right, thank you, Dr. Z. Thank you, I appreciate it.